if you break trust with your team members, you can't just get trust back. Angela Nelms discusses how to build a positive work culture and what to do to detoxify a team's culture. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rob Osell, engineering lead at This.Labs, here for another episode in our series about engineering leadership. Today, I'm here with Angela Gil Nelms, uh, soon to be CEO, COO of Atos Imaging. Angela, how are you doing today? I am great, Rob. Thanks for having me. Ah, thank you for being here. Now, listen, Angela's a very impressive person. She has a lot of things I could have introduced her as, but I think just for the people that don't know you already, could you kind of give us a little bit of an introduction to kind of who you are, kind of how you get to be the CEO of Atos Imaging and just sort of a bit of the other things that you're involved with? Love it. Sure. Absolutely. So I'll give you a little bit of my background. It's a little all over the place, which I think is part of the beauty of what I bring to future roles. But I am a biomedical engineer. I went to Georgia Tech. I am so loyal to Georgia Tech, so I just have to throw that out right now. And I started off my career at Medtronic, ran clinical trials there, and spent most of my career in the clinical trial space. My first COO role was at Florence Healthcare, which I started as a director of product and over years built a software company, which to all engineers out there, I knew nothing about software when I took that role. So hopefully we'll talk about going into crazy areas as an engineer, but I learned how to do it because I believe engineers can learn how to do anything. And that was my first COO role. I am currently the COO of Renova RX, which is a biopharmaceutical company working on a treatment for pancreatic cancer. And I am soon to be COO of Atos Imaging, which I am super stoked about. It is the future of facilities management, utilizing 3D imaging, AI, tagging, everything you can possibly do to streamline and make buildings more efficient and the lives of the team members there more efficient. And that's kind of my professional life. Now on the side, <laughs> what I do on the side, I am also COO uh, or CEO of Recovery Advocate Network. That is a mental health organization. And I am the podcast host of our podcast, which is Recovery Advocate Network, Coffee and Conversation. I also serve on multiple boards at Georgia Tech, including the College of Engineering board and the board to the president of Georgia Tech. And then when I'm not doing those things, I love to blacksmith, wood turn. I used to race Ironmans, so I've done six Ironmans, but Rob, trust me, I've really gained 20 pounds since I've lived in California. I couldn't possibly do an Ironman, so we are not... Anything about exercise is off limits for the rest of this podcast. Okay, deal. Well, I will avoid the cliche and ask you where you find the time and the energy to do all of these things. But <laughs> I think one of the things that I'm curious about, and you made reference to this, is that you've had a lot of very high level leadership experiences in a lot of different areas of technology, a lot of different industries, a lot of different companies, some of which uh, different parts in your career, right? You didn't go in necessarily being like a developer with those experiences and built up to it. So I'm kind of curious what you think you bring and how you approach this that allows you to be successful in such a wide variety of situations and, and not be intimidated, you know, before you sort of take that on. Well, to be clear, I was very intimidated when I <laughs> took on the director of product role at Florence. But I will say, I think a couple of caveats is one, I... We in earlier, we talked about individuals going into second careers. Okay, engineering mm -hmm. is actually a second career for me. I worked in finance. I hated, hated, hated finance. And so listeners, I will tell you, I will reiterate repeatedly, life is too short to do a job or career you hate. So I will say that as many times you can message me and I can talk to you about that offline as much as you want. And I, I was really good at finance. I hated it. And so at 29, I decided it was brilliant as a single mom with a special needs two-year-old to go back to school at Georgia Tech to get my degree in biomedical engineering. And I think one of the beauties of that is that I knew I needed to work hard because I had to support my child, okay? And, but I was also older and had seen, di I'd had different life experiences. I'd worked with different cultures. I had managed a branch for a finance company down in Florida that was incredibly diverse. And I already kind of understood how building teams that were very diverse was very important. And so for my senior design project, our team was the very first ever interdisciplinary project. And 
I want to tie this into first engineers and leaders. Uh, the answer is always no if you don't ask the question, right? And so here we were back in 2006, and we were about to do our capstone senior design project. And typically at that time, not just typically, but at Georgia Tech, this is how it was. Everyone, you would have four or five biomedical engineers and you would team up and you would do a project. I thought that was stupid because we all took the same classes. So I went to the head of the department and said, hey, I want to have someone from computer engineering, material science, and from biomedical engineering and come together and us build a project together. And he said, okay, if you can convince the other departments to do it, you can do it. So I went and convinced the other departments. Now, this meant we did three presentations, three papers, but we had a fully closed loop system. And I remember at the capstone design presentation, the other students said, well, this isn't fair because she had people from other departments. And the head said, she asked and you didn't. Well, the reason I want to point that out is the beauty of that is when I went to interview for jobs my the, in November of 2006, I graduated in May of 2007, I interviewed for three jobs. I got offers from all three. The minute I told them in the interview that I worked at that multidisciplinary, multicultural team, learning to work with engineers of all areas and build a solid, cohesive project, it was like, might drop, hire her now. And I learned something there is that if you can solve a problem, any problem, and you can work with people from all backgrounds, you can then work as an engineer. And if you're willing to be, I heard a student from Georgia Tech this fall use this phrase, and I, I told him I'm stealing it. This idea of being a learning engineer, I love it. Just spend your life being a learning engineer. But if you can do those things, then the sky is the limit. You can go into, I mean, I've worked in medical devices and running clinical trials. I helped build a software company from the ground up, worked in the biopharmaceutical company. And now I'm going back into software, but in facilities management, which full transparency, I don't know any of these acronyms or anything. I mean, it's gonna be hysterical. I'm gonna learn so much from the team. Uh, I'm not afraid about this new role. I'm super excited about it because I now have the confidence knowing I have those skills to solve problems and that's what matters. Yeah, and I, and I love that that can be something that other people can latch onto too, right? This yes. idea that uh, that other people can be inspired by that, that can that are inspired with working with or working under a, a leader who embraces that concept of, I may not be fully up to speed now, but I know I'll get there. I'll know I'll get there with you. I'll make mistakes. We'll figure it out together. That's a good culture for a team. And I think that's maybe a compelling reason why they'd want to invite someone in, in that state. I remember at Florence, it was so funny. I, I started, right, and I was hired. And actually, when Ryan Jones recruited me, I laughed. I was like, I know nothing about software. <laughs> like, why, right? And I started, and I he had me do the first sprint planning because I was director of product. And after sprint planning, he said, that wasn't really what I was expecting it to be. <laughs> and I just laughed and I was like, of course, I don't even have a clue. I Googled sprint planning and this is kind of like what I hacked out of it, right? And and then the team used to, I mean, I think being a good leader is you have to be able to laugh at yourself and be honest and be transparent. Mm -hmm. So I'm really good at saying when someone uses a fancy word, I don't know, I'll say, whoa, whoa wait, <laughs> what does that word mean? So when I started in stand up, actually using correct words, I mean, the team would like give me high fives. I remember the time when I, I put on Facebook, I remember when I used to think hamburger was something you got at McDonald's versus like the hamburger and software. <laughs> and it was like this mind shift component of it. But oh my gosh, it's brought so much joy. And I think, you know what? Team members love to teach their leaders. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, leaders, if you're listening to this, guess what? Your team members actually love to teach you things and love for you to learn new skills too. So be a learn, learn from them. That's so exciting. Yeah. Our CEO, Tracy Lee is sort of, you know, she's founder, she's very smart, very technical, but she wasn't a developer by trade. Um, but yet, you know, I tell this to a lot of people who look up to her and say, oh, I want to be a developer like her. I said, well, she, you know, it's not classically trained in that. But she is still a Microsoft MVP. She's still 
a Google GDE and she's this and this and all these other things. And how does she do that? She does that because she knows how to ask questions. She knows how to connect people. She knows how to affect change and she knows how to accept her own limitations, but yet not use those as excuses or things that would block her. And yeah, that is very empowering and inspiring to follow somebody that's in that state because it kind of allows you to be a little bit, I, I assume you would agree, it allows your teammates to be a little bit um, vulnerable as well. Yes. To not feel yeah. like you're in this giant ego competition where everybody's trying to be as buttoned up. Everybody just wears their resume on their, on their clothes <laughs> every day at work type of situation. Absolutely. I love that. That's amazing. Well, wonderful. I, I, one of the things that uh, we were talking about just before we started airing, which I thought was fascinating and I thought it would be a good conversation starter here, is that when we think about companies, and you've been, had the experience of working with some uh, startups as well, and even some very early stage startups, that you know, when people think about that, just the frenetic pace of that environment and just the drive to find that fit and to find the right product and to get everything out and to not run out of runway, but yet you have an interesting opinion about what startups should focus on that I think it would be interesting if you could share that with everybody. Rob, I love that because I do. So when when Ryan Jones recruited me to Florence, after I laughed and said, I'm not going to software company, I know nothing about software, <laughs> which the joke was, did I laugh out loud or in my head? And all the <laughs> team was like, you definitely laughed out loud. That's my personality. And I went to him and I said, okay, here's the deal. I will come to the company, and but I have three pieces of criteria. And these, these are my three pieces of criteria. They were back in 2016 or 2015 when he recruited me. They were still my criteria somewhat in 2024 when ATOS was recruiting me. The first one is that we were building a document management company. Okay, document management is not sexy. This was document management software for clinical research. You know what is sexy? Advancing cures. Okay. So I said back in that time, my whole background was in healthcare and I wanted, I wanted us to continue to be in healthcare. So that was one of my criteria. That's the only criteria now that has changed because when you go and pull up ATOS, they are facilities management across the board. Now, granted, I'm super excited to get ATOS into as many hospitals as I can. So I can sure. still tag that, but okay. So that was one criteria. The two most important criteria, however, I would say for who I am, Angela, as a human being, is one, I wanted to build a company that provided white glove customer service. As you know, software is not known for white glove customer service. And I just said, I, I believe in raving fans, the Nordstrom way, all of these things. I know that's how you can build and you can take over a market. And quite frankly, in Florence, that's how we took over the market and beat our competitors was that, okay? Wake love customer service. My third criteria was I wanted to, from day one, build a company that employees loved to work for. And I remember later in, in time, and I give Ryan Jones credit for just being such a humble, amazing leader, is I believe it was the board was talking about how the white glove customer service and our lack of employee turnover was our calling card. And Ryan said, you know, I have Angela to thank for that because I made that a criteria. And every time, you know, he would get into being a CEO and thinking about runway and the things that are top of mind for a CEO, it's very easy to forget how important those other things were. But he had me as a partner and we were great partners together, right? And I would constantly say, no, we are taking care of the employees in this way. And we are taking care of the culture every single way. So I wrote years ago, a blog post about why it's important to build a solid culture from the ground up. And it, it's hard because in the beginning, what you are thinking about is how many months of runway do we have? Okay, when are we gonna have our prototype out? What's the MVP? We need to focus on that. We don't need to focus on getting to know each other as human beings. We don't need to focus on doing cultural outings where we go and we volunteer for a charity. Uh, one of the things that Ryan and Andreas, the co-founder started even before I was there is alternating each month employee outings that alternated between sport, food and charity. And we would go and do those things to, to bond together, not working, but as human beings, right? And when you focus on building that collaborative team from the beginning and not letting go in the hard times, and every time there were times when we made, I mean, there were times when we made a mistake once with our 409A 
And I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we made this mistake. I, I remember walking up to Ryan. I was like, uh, we need to take a walk. Um, I will tell you the bad news of the mistake <laughs> yeah. we made. And we figured out how to protect the employees. You know why? Because that culture was what was most important at that point. And versus I've seen situations walking in where the culture is very toxic and you're trying to turn it around. And one of the analogies I use is that we fo focus on culture from the beginning. It's so much easier to continue to maintain, to hire well, to not keep those brilliant jerks that are the drop of vinegar in the milk, to mm -hmm. do those things right. But if you try and ignore because everyone has, every company has a culture. Uh, so if you don't focus on the culture you want, you're going to get a culture. You just may not have the one you want. Okay. But later on, it is so much harder to turn around a speeding train once it's going. And I've tried to do it in a toxic environment. And I'm really good at leadership and really good at building team culture. And you can do it to a certain extent. But turning around that speeding train, especially if the toxic components of it come from upper level uh, leadership, you can't mm -hmm. do it. And it will destroy a company. It will destroy people and their teams. And so if I can encourage anyone, we talked about different resources. What I used to do at, at Florence for my people managers, because this is so important, I had books that I would insist on them reading. One, as we talked about, was Radical Candor. Or if that one's too harsh for you, Making of a Manager is also an amazing book. And also a good the, one. Yeah. yes, and the other one I love is Culture Map. And it is, hey, we're all going to get, if we're going to be on Zoom, fine. Turn on your cameras. I don't care if you're in your pajamas and you're in a baseball cap or you have no makeup on. Or I don't care. I want to see you as a human and build this human connection. What, what really resonates about this idea is, like you said, right, even if you think your culture, having a good culture is TBD, someday we're going to figure out what the what our way is, and we're going to have something named after us, and they'll teach us teach about us in, in leadership books and things like that. <laughs> you know, but we're not, we're not worried about it now, right? You still have a culture. And I like this idea that, you know, on the technical side of things, I think it's maybe more broadly understood and accepted, this notion of technical debt. And you have to be careful with the engineering, especially in a nascent product, that if you build up too much technical debt, you'll never pivot out of it. But yet, we'll so willingly accept this cultural debt, I guess, if you want to call it that, and somehow are not considered of the fact that you could break it in a fundamental way, and there'd be no real way to pivot out of it. Rob, that is so brilliant. I'm, I'm going to steal that in the future. I just... <laughs> I'm going to say it out loud here so that you could then, you know, say, I told you so. Uh, that is that, that is brilliant. I, I love that. I do also love that I've been in software long enough that I can understand how impactful that is. Exactly. Cultural debt. It is it is. We talked earlier about trust. Culture is built off of trust. And if you the if you break trust with your team members, you can't just get trust back like you can't and the amount of just the amount of time loss and efficiency and productivity and passion and heart and soul the the human brain isn't even as creative as it possibly could be if it's not in an environment it feels it can thrive in and so when you think about what is the best way when i think about how do I want to extend my runway and have this company last as long as, you know what I want to do? <laughs> I want to keep my best employees as long as I possibly can. You know how I'm going to do that? I'm going to do that by taking care of those employees. I'm going to do that by growing those employees. I started this five resume bullet points program years ago with the idea, I want every employee to constantly have five things they want to be working on that they would then go add to their LinkedIn. This whole idea that you can't update your LinkedIn until you're looking for a new job is ridiculous. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. It is absolutely ridiculous, okay? So I want team members, I want you to have five things, and it could be work-related or it could not, you know? Maybe you wanna take a Toastmasters class, or maybe you wanna do a yoga certification or something like that, I don't care what it is. But have five things, because I believe if a company, if you're encouraging your team members and you're making it a habit and a part of your culture, of growth and you're constantly telling them and my current company i have two employees that i'm constantly saying to them okay 
this is your next promotion. These are the areas that you need to, and this is the line item it will say on your LinkedIn when you go and complete this action item, right? And so they they inherently trust me because they know I'm constantly, I'm not constantly thinking about Angela. I'm constantly thinking about this individual on my quality team that I'm encouraging her to take over both sides of quality and build this LMS system. And then she can put on her LinkedIn how she built this LMS system and improved our FDA inspection readiness, right? I'm thinking about those things. And so she trusts me. And if she trusts me, then she's gonna be have that open creative mind and passion and willingness to be successful. And that's how you keep employees. That's how you extend your runway. That's how your team is successful. And there really is something to be said about this idea of, you know, mission and understanding the mission is important. And I think that's a big part of what you've been talking about. But I think this idea that if you do have that trust basis, and if you do have this enthusiasm, if everybody's happy to show up to work on a Monday morning, um, people want to go the extra mile. That doesn't have to mean extra hours or anything like that. That just means that in an in a in a game of inches in a situation of inches they will push for that last bit and you know when when life is just full of opportunities those little moments when someone's really trying to get there for that last little bit if all of your employees are actively doing that all the time you know what difference could that make you know small companies and then if you manifest across tens of thousands of employees in a large company what could you even imagine the magnification of that effect well, and also just the memories you have, Rob. I, I love what you were just saying because I was thinking about sometimes when th this one particular example back at Florence and Kevin, who is the head of the dev team, and I were pushing out the next version of our software. I think it was, we, we somehow always managed to do these on holidays, which was never originally planned. But you know how you think it's going to pass QA and it's yeah, like, yeah. okay, it has it. Yeah. So, you know, and so I, I remember we were in the process of moving from one small office in our incubator to a new small office in our incubator. We need to push the software. Kevin and I are like on a Friday night, sit somewhere I have a picture of this, sitting on the floor with our laptops, pushing to production. Now, here's the thing, like it's after hours, we're laughing about it, we're having fun. If he was listening to this podcast, he would laugh about it and have fun because our culture was so great, it, it didn't matter. No one was clocking hours or minutes or whatnot. And it's a good memory because we were so dedicated, we didn't mm -hmm. care that we didn't have a good setup. We were gonna push this out to the customers, you know, no matter what it took. And those kind of memories are, you know, amazing, right? Or the memories, when you talk about culture, the other part of culture that we mentioned is that mistakes should almost be celebrated. And I remember one of the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes or challenges we had, which ended up being a biggest, a big success at Florence is we had our first big customer. And I still remember where I was sitting on a Saturday and we went to roll it out to production and my laptop, I'm sitting on my couch and I, my dev team, CEO, and the customers all sit and watch it crash. Oh, they no. completely crash. And we're like, oh my gosh. And so Ryan calls me and, and we're like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're obviously going to roll back software, right? So we roll back the software and we told the team, here's it, we're rolling back software. Everyone close your laptops. On Monday, we're just going to get in the conference room and we're going to figure it out together. And we told the customer, okay, that was unfortunate. <laughs> you know what? That customer ended up being one of our biggest raving fans because we didn't hide anything from them. We just said, we have to figure out what went yeah. wrong. It actually helped us later too, because then it allowed, when I talked to them about some of the features they wanted, it allowed me to say, okay, we're going to do this in smaller bite-sized pieces to set up everything for success. But you know what? For years later, the team talked about that because they said, here we had this huge failure that some companies and some executives would have been blasting the dev team or blasting the QA team, right? And we were just all like, nope, enjoy your weekend. We as a team work on this together. And that built so much camaraderie between everyone. And people were willing to say, okay, this is not gonna work. This is gonna fail, this is whatever. They were able to speak up because of the way we reacted when we had that. So celebrating 
failures, which is really the best way towards success, is so important for a culture. And the other side of what you're saying is is transparency. Uh, you know, I, I I love that you, you know, one of the great uh, mentors I've had in my career says that really taught me the value of just saying what's true. Uh, yeah. It's it's much easier to just say it than it is to find the right phrasing and the spin and the right positioning. That's not to say that marketing and messaging isn't important. It is very important, but don't undervalue the value, the, the the power of just saying it. And you know that example I think is powerful as you explain it, both for how you're able to respond to the failure, but also for the idea that you're able to just go to a client and say, "Hey, that was bad, uh, but we'll fix it," and and that people really respond and resonate both customers and employees to that level of trust that you show in them through your transparency and i think that that's a another great lesson from that yeah i love it you know one of the when we talk about culture and one one of the employees she was employee number 10 and she wrote this on my linkedin as one of my recommendation things and she said about me and culture. And she said, Angela was talking about culture when there were 10 of us in a room and we were often sharing each other's lunch. And I thought, why are we talking about culture at this point? She's still at Florence to this day, years later. And she's like, it built the entire company. I mean, I think Florence maybe has like 250 employees or something, they're highly successful. I'm incredibly proud, the team is amazing. And she, she was like, back then, I thought Angela's crazy at this point. And so to any leader listening to this, if people around you think you're crazy, then have them talk to me and I will be more than happy to advocate for your passion towards spending the time and energy towards building healthy teams, do that leadership coaching, you know, have someone come in with your leadership team and observe and be willing to learn. One of the things I learned when we did executive coaching was we talked about context switching. So as a COO, <laughs> I hate those Mac reactions. I really hope my camera comes back on. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put my hands down. So as a COO, I love being a COO, by the way. So despite the fact you, you stuttered in the beginning at CEO, no, I, I love the fact that the CEO of Atos Imaging is absolutely badass and amazing. And I cannot wait to be his right-hand person. One of the things I love about being a COO is I can be that bridge across all the different departments and I can hear something in marketing and know and transfer it over to the dev team, or I can hear something in customer service and, and take it to the dev. I can be that glue. Okay. One of the things that's really hard as a leader in that type of role is that constant context switching. And I found out through leadership coaching that one of the things I was doing at one stage was I would be overbooked, right? Books, meetings all day long. And I would go from one topic to a completely different topic to a completely different topic. And I would walk into a meeting in problem solving mode. Like, I'm just going to walk in, tell me the problem. Uh, yeah. I'll fix it and then move on to the next one. And so I was just being a jerk, right? And <laughs> I wasn't intending to be a jerk, but I was just like, da, 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 right? And, and thank goodness for excellent leadership coaching <laughs> that observed. And thank goodness I was, I'm always willing to grow. So I always want to know those areas I can improve. And I learned that that's what I was doing. So what I did was, and this is another area of transparency I love. What I did was one, I said, I'm no longer, I need a five minute break at least between meetings. Mm -hmm. Two, <laughs> I started covering my mouth up in meetings. So I get messages in Zoom. I see you're covering your mouth. Well, that's to keep me from talking. I, I need to shut up. And, and three, I said out loud to my team, if I do this, I want you to speak up because this is not my best self. This is not how I'm helping you. This is me just not being the leader I want to be. And I had people who, after they learned to trust me and knew I really wanted that feedback, who would say, Okay, Angela, I think you're kind of stressed right now, aren't you? Which was code for, okay, you should slow your roll and sit back and listen and stop being in problem solving mode. But that was another part of culture was that bringing in the, the money and the finances for executive coaching early on to look at your core team and say, what are you doing well? And how can you guys grow and improve? And then the team being willing to do that and grow together. And it's just been amazing. Well, 
as we kind of wrap up here, I know some people are sitting here listening and going, okay, well, uh, I missed my opportunity to hire Angela, so I need to at least <laughs> imitate her a little bit. So, you know, maybe people aren't sitting in a toxic environment. Maybe they're just sitting in an immature environment or an in-progress environment. And they're sort of thinking about, well, like, how do I start this process of kind of building up this culture? Do I need to start from the bottom and get really passionate people that want to push this up? Do I need to just be really aware and very involved in everything and push this really from the top down? Can you maybe help people get a couple tips on maybe some things that they could look for to start to improve their culture on their teams? Wow. That's a loaded question. It's great. <laughs> top down, bottom up. First off, bottom up will not work. Um, it, it really, because if you have toxic leaders at the top, it does not matter what happens. Even if you bring in yeah. an amazing culture person, if the leaders at the top are toxic, it is impossible. The company will still not be successful in that area. So it is, there are a couple things. If you as a company really want this, it has to be a dedicated part of your day-to-day -day actions as a leader as the from the top. And then you really kind of need to do a sandwich approach. And I would say the first one thing is, um, I'll use this as an example. Yeah, I'm about to go to Atos. Okay. First off, Atos has an amazing culture. I'm like so blessed and, and love and whatnot. So, you know, what I'm not going to do in going in there is I'm not going to go in and say, oh, we should change this, 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 and this, and this, because they would just say, okay, get out of here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in in the first 30 and 60 days, and I am going to be a learner. I'm going to be a student. And so, one thing that I would recommend for a team, if you're in that area, is first off, from the top up, if you are gonna take this out on a mission, you need to document it and have accountability with your board, with the entire company. It needs to be said out loud, and then you need to figure out a way, even if you put on a calendar reminder every Monday or in Slack every Monday, a reminder about it, okay? So you need some sort of accountability. Secondly, the least expensive thing you can do is hire an amazing leadership coach to come in and sit back with you and help you map this out. Hire someone who's from the outside, they have no ulterior motive, and they can sit and it is their job, they've done this before, it is their job to look at all the challenges because I'm sure you have a lot of challenges, we all do, right? And you can't, Rome was not built in a day, you're not gonna fix them all in a day. You want to make tiny pieces of improvement, but you also need to figure out what the, the biggest ROI is in each of those, okay? And really the, the biggest ROI you have in the beginning is committing to it and being held accountable because you don't want the Hawthorne effect either where like while you're being watched, you're doing it. And then the minute no one's watching or whatever, you just forget about it, okay? You don't wanna do that. So commit to it, be accountable, let your board know, let your entire team know this is gonna be our focus for 2024 or whatever your period is. Find something and hire a coach. That will be, you will think, I don't wanna spend the money on that. Trust me, it is so worth it. Hire someone, have them come in and evaluate and then listen and build out that roadmap. And then th that roadmap is not a secret. Like build out that roadmap and then make it transparent to the company, right? I had no problem letting everyone in the company know that Angela sucks at context switching. So help hold me accountable. So I would say as to a leader, if you're horrible at micromanaging, let the company know this and give them the authority to help you improve in that area. So one, commit to it, figure out how to be held accountable and have someone come in who's done it before to evaluate and build out a, a scalable, sustainable process for you to actually implement it and be successful at it. Yeah, I love that idea that even if you've been in a company for a long time, if you don't have a sense of what the culture is, you do need either, you need to observe it and ideally with somebody else to understand even what you have. You can't start by saying, this is what I want if you're entirely in a different dimension from that culture, you have to kind of understand what you have and then decide how to move it. I like that. Well, there's this quote that says, the eye cannot see itself. Mm. 
So bringing in someone from the outside who was just going to and tell them, tell them like, look, I, I don't need you to pat me on the back. I don't need any ego things. Be as harsh as you want to be. You know, I'm going to be humble because what success looks like for me is building a solid, robust company that employees love to work for. Because when they do, this company will be successful and these people will be successful and we will all love what we were we are doing. So do that. But the eye cannot see itself. So the idea that you can figure out for yourself all of the flaws is absolutely incorrect. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Can you let people know as we wrap up here where they can find out more or connect with you online? Absolutely. So I am on LinkedIn at Angela Gill Nelms. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at Be Brave, Be Badass. Wonderful. All right. Well, that is going to be it for us today. Thank you to Angela for being our guest. And thank you to each of you for listening. Hope to see you all next time. As we close out, I would like to thank today's sponsor, This.Labs, who would like me to remind you that sometimes it's hard to bridge the gap between business objectives and tech implementation, and it can get messy. This dot is trusted by top names like Meta, Google, and T-Mobile, and they love helping business leaders fulfill their strategic digital initiatives. Check them out at thisdot.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Thanks again. Hope to see you all next time. Before we get back to our conversation, we wanted to say thank you to this.labs, who is the sponsor of today's show. If you need help with a project that has failed to deliver on time or are in need of a team that feels true ownership over your engineering projects, definitely hit up this.labs. They specialize in helping business leaders ensure their strategic digital initiatives stay on track. Trusted by companies like PlayStation, Capital One, Herman Miller, PayPal, and T-Mobile, you can find them at thisdot.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Now, let's return to our show.